Hello, здравствуйте. I'm Nikolai Drozdov, and I'm a Russian naturalist. Over here, I help present a nature series for television called В мире животных, in the world of animals, which is watched by 200 million people. You see, we have a very big country, and for the past few years, Perestroika and Glasnost have opened it up and revealed many of its problems to the eyes of the world. But there is a much more pleasurable side that I'd like to show you. Stop, пожалуйста. For two years, I have been working with a team from the BBC's Natural History Unit. Together, we have traveled the length and breadth of the Soviet Union, the biggest country in the world, visiting some of the remotest places and filming the wild creatures that inhabit them. It was from traditional settings like this, the historic town of Suzdal in Europe and Russia, with its churches and monasteries, that people set out to explore the vastness of the continent. So we can begin our exploration of the natural history of the Soviet Union and to start our journey through the realms of the Russian bear. My country covers one-sixth of the land surface of our planet. Our northern shore is bounded by the Arctic Ocean and stretches nearly halfway around the world across 11 time zones. The winters are long and bitterly cold. This is the realm of our great white bear. I'll be showing you the wildlife of our Arctic region in a future episode. This frozen frontier merges with the biggest forest in the world. A carpet of hardy conifers called the taiga runs from Scandinavia right the way across Siberia to the Pacific Ocean and covers over a third of my country. Our forests are far from empty. Wolves are common. Although they are hunted, we still have lots of space for them. Also padding through our northern forests are lynx. And European bison. But tsars of our forests are the brown bears. The symbol of Russia, 100,000 of them live in this country more than anywhere else. So this is indeed the realm of the bear. Most of them sleep through the winter, but a few remain restless and are very bad tempered.
to the south, the forest gives way to the boundless steppes. The steppe region rolls from our border with Western Europe to Mongolia. Here, in the dry center of the continent, trees fail to grow, and only grasses and small shrubs take root. Saiga, a unique kind of antelope, live on the steppes of Kazakhstan. Big herds migrate across these grassy plains for thousands of kilometers, seeking the best grazing. During May, the calves are born, when the flush of fresh grass enables the females to produce plenty of nourishing milk. Saigas are designed for the steps. Their bulbous nose filters out the dust and during winter warms and moistens the frosty air. We have about a million of them, mostly in Kazakhstan, and the rest on the steppes of Kalmykia, north of the Caspian Sea. In Central Asia, we have extensive deserts. showing you some of our desert animals and plants in a later program and taking you to Bad Khiz, an amazing nature reserve on our border with Afghanistan. the Tian Shan, or Celestial Mountains, on our remote frontier with China. Snow leopards roam these icy peaks. Although seldom seen, we have about a thousand of these big cats. We also have a unique pale race of the brown bear, they share the Tenshan with many tribal people and their domestic animals, like yak. We'll see more of them in our next episode. Lake Baikal in southern Siberia is the largest freshwater lake in the world. And as you see, our Russian bears are much in evidence around its shores. And beyond Siberia is Kamchatka. Kamchatka is a part of the Ring of Fire, a line of volcanic activity that girdles the Pacific Ocean. With 33 active volcanoes and many geysers, it's one of our most spectacular regions. rivers run with several kinds of spawning salmon. 
These sockeye salmon are prey for our biggest Russian bears, which in Kamchatka grow to the size of Alaskan grizzlies. But we start our journey way to the west in European Russia, on the northern border of the Caspian Sea, the location of one of our greatest and most beautiful wetlands. Here in the Soviet Union is the largest inland sea on our planet, the Caspian. Unlike its neighbor, the Black Sea, which opens into the Mediterranean via the Bosporus, the Caspian is completely enclosed and has no access to the oceans of the world. Actually, the surface on which I'm floating is 27 meters below the world sea level. The Caspian is fed chiefly by the Volga, one of our great rivers. It starts life more than 2,000 miles away in northern Russia. Here, where the Volga comes and meets the Caspian, it splits into more than 800 channels and forms an immense fertile delta. The river Volga is the architect of this fertile landscape. It's deposited huge quantities of sediment on the northern edge of the Caspian Sea, forming a great sprawling delta 200 kilometers across. Beyond the maze of channels, reed beds and lagoons, there are shallows barely a meter deep, extending into the Caspian for 50 kilometers. This green jewel is a naturalist's paradise a quarter of a million pairs of wildfowl nest here, including 3,000 pairs of mute swans. Fish abound in the shallow water of the northern Caspian and their food for cormorants. About a hundred thousand breed on the delta. They construct their nest of sticks well above the water level. Several kinds of fish-eating birds form mixed colonies in the waterside woodlands. The night heron hunts at dusk. But the gray heron fishes during the hours of daylight. Nearly 4,000 pairs of gray herons breed in the Volga Delta. It's a common species found right the way across Russia. By early April, all the birds in the colonies have eggs. Other creatures appear during the first days of spring. Grass snakes like the dampness and the numerous marsh frogs. In April, the snakes emerge from hibernation and are preoccupied with mating in the warm spring sunshine. A single female is the center of attraction, with many males trying to copulate with her. She excites them by her scent, which she leaves on the ground wherever she slithers. Above them, a pair of pendulum teats are busy building. They are amazingly skilled architects and are making a hanging home. To begin with, they construct a ring of twisted fibers to bear the weight of the nest and its occupants. The birds take three weeks to complete their purse-shaped home. This is the halfway stage. The abundant wildlife of the Volga Delta 
is dependent upon the spring floods. The river Volga is the lifeblood of the delta. During spring, snow melting in more northerly regions of Russia produces a surge of water and causes the river and its tributaries to overflow. The floods cover large areas of the countryside and deposit huge amounts of nourishing silt. For a month or two, Aquatic creatures like carp move into the flooded fields. They spawn in the shallows, each female shedding over a million eggs. Some get stranded and are scavenged by white-tailed sea eagles. This region is one of their strongholds in my country. The eaglets are now four weeks old, and for several months they'll depend upon their parents. For fish-eating birds, the floods are of crucial importance, providing a bonanza of food when there are nestlings to satisfy. By the end of April, the cormorants are busy, commuting up to 50 kilometers to and from their fishing grounds, with bulging crops of food for their youngsters. An adult alone consumes three quarters of a kilo of fish a day, equivalent to one sixth of its body weight. After four weeks of incubation, the herons have hatched. The chicks will need a lot of nourishment to make them grow as tall as their parents. Herons are expert at spearing frogs and fish. This one has caught roach and perch, nicely softened by digestive juices, so that its tiny offspring can pack off small pieces. Food which accidentally falls out of the nest is quickly scavenged down below. The little egret's plumes were once worth twice their weight in gold. That's why part of the Volga Delta was established as the Astrakhan Nature Reserve to protect such birds from hunters. A glossy ibis, a family of wild boar also looks for scraps beneath the nest. During spring, millions of marsh frogs are attracted to the flooded fields. As evening approaches, the croaking of these amorous amphibians reaches a climax, and the males advertise for mates bloated with the eggs. The volume of the chorus bears witness to the immense fertility of the delta.
The damp vegetation and shallow water encourages an abundance of insects. Midges and mosquitoes rise in swarms as the sun begins to set. And these are taken by migrating birds. By mid-May, the flooded pastures and the wooded margins of the waterways are at their prettiest. The air resonates with bird song. The white-tailed sea eaglets are now two months old, and each now requires the equivalent of a fair-sized carp a day, but they are still only offered the tenderest morsels. That's too bony, perhaps. But the food is a bit lively today. They'll have to learn how to subdue struggling fish. Three sparrows lodge in the eagle's bulky nest. Regular exercise strengthens their flight muscles. Down below, the pendulum teeth are putting the finishing touches to their amazing home. Hanging over water by a narrow stalk, the chamber and its contents will be almost impregnable. Now the pair can begin to breed. By the end of May, the lagoons are strewn with dazzling water lilies, and the aquatic life is very active. A new generation of damselflies emerges from the water. They've spent two years as aquatic larvae. Now they pursue their courtship with a sense of urgency. The dusky-winged males compete for the greenish females. Although they mate on the water-side vegetation, the females go under the water to deposit their eggs. After mating, the males keep hold of their partners, but get dragged beneath the surface. Soon they'll come up again. Down below, billions of microscopic creatures are locked in a struggle for existence. The tepid water stimulates the breeding of planktonic animals like water fleas. These are captured by hydra, minute polyps, whose arms are furnished with deadly harpoons. The plankton supports shoals of newly hatched fish, including sticklebacks, roach, perch, and carp. The young carp have now moved from the flooded pastures into deeper water. And the male pipefish 
is about to give birth. It's related to the seahorses, and like them, the male receives his mate's spawn into a pouch beneath his belly. Eventually, his brood joins the plankton. The marine ancestors of pipe fish must have come here a long time ago, when the Caspian Sea had a connection with the Mediterranean. Altogether, 50 kinds of fishes live in the murky but fertile waters of the Volga Delta. On the floating world of the lily pads, young grass snakes are on the prowl. Although they are barely the size of bootlaces, they are deadly. They are more or less amphibious, and they're after tadpoles. Such is a competition for food that even a tadpole in the mouth isn't safe until it's swallowed. These water gardens are favored by whiskered terns, which fly all the way from Africa to nest in them. They construct their flimsy nests among the flowering water lilies. The lily leaves are buoyant enough to support the birds, and later on the lagoons will provide plenty of food for their nestlings. A different community of birds breeds in the extensive reed beds that surround the lagoons. The rich mud and warm summer climate of the Caspian encourage the reeds to grow five meters high, which is ideal for purple herons. The thick stands of reeds are excellent cover for their nestlings. About 2,500 pairs of purple herons nest in the Volga Delta. They settle in loose colonies in the middle of the reed beds. The adults are exceptionally well camouflaged. Out in the sunlight, their rich coloration is easy to see. But down below, they vanish from view. Beyond the reeds, the deep channels of the busy river Volga, the spring floods trigger the spawning migration of the sturgeon. These impressive fish spend most of their lives in the brackish Caspian Sea, but shed their eggs in the upper reaches of the Volga. They hug the bottom, grabbing for worms, mollusks, and small fish, which they locate with their highly sensitive barbels. They then suck up their food with their telescopic mouths. Sturgeon are the sole survivors of an ancient group of fishes that lived over a hundred million years ago. But in the Caspian, several kinds prosper like nowhere else on Earth. But many of these sturgeon fail to get very far up the Volga on their spawning run. <laughs> These fishermen are intent on catching female sturgeon. 
the source of that essentially Russian product, caviar. It's a profitable business, employing about a thousand people. Nowadays, the fishery is maintained by releasing a hundred million young sturgeon into the Caspian every year. The survivors return up to 17 years later, the females laden with eggs. Nothing is wasted, but the valuable rows full of caviar are given special treatment on board the floating factory ships. Each year, about a thousand tons of these delicious black pearls of the Caspian are collected. Most of it is exported for foreign currency. Fish also support the seabirds of Jimchuzny, a strip of sand 80 kilometers out to sea. The most spectacular of them are the great black-headed gulls. Each is the size of a goose. They're almost a Russian speciality, virtually confined to the Caspian. 10,000 pairs breed on this island. That's nearly half the world population. Like most gulls, these birds steal from each other. So the parents hang on to their partially digested fish, while their youngsters take their fill. Amongst the gulls are super terns. Caspian terns are the largest of their kind. They are like big sea gulls. Despite their name, they are found all over the world except South America. Two thousand pairs nest on Jimchuzny, and by June, the adults have got young mouths to feed. These hefty terns catch large fish and often return with two bigger mouthfuls for their offspring. Caspian herrings feature largely in their diet. They are marine fish and must have entered the Caspian when it was once connected to the open sea. The seabirds of Jimchuzny have to compete for fish with Caspian seals. To a gull chick, a seal must look enormous, but they're quite small, just over a meter long, and one of the smallest seals in the world. He's okay. But how did these marine mammals get into the enclosed Caspian Sea? Their closest relative is the ringed seal of the Arctic. The Caspian was once much larger and 50 meters above its present level. Connections were then established between the Volga and the Baltic Sea, thus providing a passage southwards for the seals. By July, the water level in the delta is at its lowest. There's a touch of the Orient as the lotus start to bloom. 
it's a native of Southeast Asia, and in Russia grows only in the Caspian and on our eastern border with China. They thrive in shallow water, drawing nourishment from the organic sediment brought here by the Volga. Beneath the surface, the drama between predators and their prey continues. The larvae of great diving beetles are voracious killers. The predator injects a corrosive mixture of digestive juices through its hollow fangs, which liquefy the victim's flesh. Then it sucks the fluid into its own stomach, leaving only an empty shell. But some get their comeuppance from above. The whiskered turns have hatched, and the chicks are appealing for food. The parents bring a continuous supply of aquatic larvae, including those of diving beetles. They also catch small fish and damselflies. The sea eagles are now nearly ready to fly, and both parents bring food to the nest. In Western Europe, these eagles were almost exterminated, but in my country there are about 2,000 pairs. A hundred and fifty pairs nest in the delta, 30 within the Astrakhan nature reserve. This year, the floods have lingered longer than usual, and there's been a good supply of fish, so both eaglets have survived to the point of fledging. They're strong enough to move around the tree, but haven't yet plucked up the courage to launch themselves into the air. Now that they are fully grown, they are competing for every scrap of food. Inside the nature reserve, the prospect for these young birds is good, thanks to the efforts of the wardens. German Rusanov is one of them. Although wildfowl are his special interest, he'll be very pleased that another brood of eaglets is about to fledge. With protection, many birds that were formerly persecuted by fishermen have flourished here as the late summer roost of cormorants testifies. This is one of the great sights of Astrakhan. After the breeding season, 10,000 cormorants gather each day to rest in the willows. Fisherman's nightmare. 
Astrakhan isn't merely a sanctuary. It's also a staging post of international importance for long-distance seasonal migrants. The early morning mist hints at autumn. But the tranquility of the scene belies the fact that this is the busiest time of the year. Our harsh winter drives millions of wildfowl out of much of Russia, and many of them settle here for a while to molt, feed, and rest. Each year, seven million migrants benefit from the riches bestowed on the delta by the river Volga. These are mostly grey-like geese. Some are local, but others have come thousands of kilometers from eastern Siberia. They are attracted to the lotus beds. Although the foliage is now dying back, the succulent roots and seed pods are full of goodness, and the shallow water makes them accessible. Such rich food provides the protein for new feathers and body fat, the fuel needed for flying long distances. Thousands of great white egrets feast on fish before migrating to the southern Caspian and the Middle East. Stirring the feet brings prey to the surface. Their onward journeys are not without danger. Cormorants may encounter oil slicks in the Persian Gulf. Snipe will run the gauntlet of guns as they travel south. Teal that nested in the Russian Arctic will provide sport for wildfowlers in Western Europe. Ruddy shell duck, a Central Asian species, spends the winter in the southern Caspian, where there are plenty of poachers. A locally rare Dalmatian pelican, en route to Iran. Once their strength and plumage are renewed, the birds put their fresh pinions to the test and fly south to escape the encroaching Russian winter. This year's young sea eagles are now independent and scavenging on the shore for dead birds and stranded fish. When the weather turns for the worse, they may also have to leave the security of Astrakhan. But before the winds from Siberia reach here, there's another crop of visitors. Hooper swans breed in the Arctic. They've flown all the way across Russia. Now they're in a hurry to reach this refuge. Their great angel wings have borne them several thousand kilometers from the tundra to this welcoming lagoon. They travel in family groups,
the parents are never far from their fully grown seedlings. The shallow water is ideal for swans. Their long necks enable them to reach the underwater roots and tubers. In late autumn, before the water freezes, 120,000 wild swans may have dropped into the Volga Delta. Other visitors from the north also put in an appearance. Saiga antelope, now in thick, woolly coats to protect them from the cold. During frosty weather, animals from the Kalmykian herd reach the Caspian shores. Despite the cold, this is their rutting season. The Caspian is the most southerly point of the Saiga's annual trek, but the swans continue much further south. As the ice advances, the swans set course for the southern Caspian, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So we conclude our look at this magnificent wetland as Siberia's icy breath sends the temperature plunging to 25 degrees Celsius of frost, causing the green jewel of the Caspian to sparkle like a diamond. On the Caspian, it's winter only for a few months. But in some parts of the Soviet Union, it's winter all the year round. In the next stage of our Soviet safari, we move to the eternal snow and ice of the celestial mountains that run along our border with China. Until then, goodbye, the Svidania.